Hi, welcome to a special episode of The Legal Mind, How the Law Thinks. In today's episode, we're going to look at the reasons for why freedom of speech is a good thing. In particular, we're going to look at the defense of free speech given by John Stuart Mill in his classic treatise, On Liberty. I hope you enjoy the episode. Should people be allowed to say and think what they want, or should there be some words or ideas that are off limits? In other words, is free speech a good idea? And if it is, what's the case for free speech? Everybody's got opinions, and lots of those ideas and beliefs are wrong. With so many people saying so many wrong things, lots of people sooner or later come to the conclusion that the best thing to do is to stop those wrong opinioned people from talking. This is not a new idea. Romans fed Christians to lions. Later, Christians burned heretics at the stake. Nothing seems more common than the impulse to use the power of the state and society to shut other groups up. The logic is pretty simple. If you think you're right, you're not doing the world any favors by letting people go around saying things that are wrong. John Stuart Mill was a philosopher living in the middle of the 19th century in England. Mill thought that suppressing thoughts and ideas was a bad thing, and he made his case in chapter 2 of his book, On Liberty, published in 1859. More than 150 years later, On Liberty remains the classic defense of freedom of expression, and the arguments that Mill made are still used to this very day to justify and defend the idea of free speech. Mill stakes out the position that just because a point of view may be unpopular is not a reason for that point of view to be suppressed. And when he says unpopular, he really means unpopular. Here's what Mill argues. If all mankind minus one were of one opinion, and only one person were of the contrary opinion, Mankind would be no more justified in silencing that one person than he, if he had the power, would be justified in silencing mankind. That's an extraordinary claim. If everybody thinks an opinion is wrong, even then, the one person who thinks it is right should not be silenced. Why not? Mill makes two arguments. First, you might be wrong and the other person might be right. And second, even if you are right, you gain a better understanding of truth when you have to consider and refute arguments from people with opposing views. Here's how Mill puts it. But the peculiar evil of silencing the expression of an opinion is that it is robbing the human race. If the opinion is right, they are deprived of the opportunity of exchanging error for truth. If wrong, they lose what is almost as great a benefit, the clearer perception and livelier impression of truth produced by its collision with error. These two arguments can broadly be called the pretension of infallibility and the danger of dead dogma. No matter how sure you are that you're right and the other person's wrong, unless you're infallible, meaning unless you're never wrong, there's a chance, however small, that you could be the one who's wrong and the other person could be the one who's right. And if you don't admit the possibility that you could be wrong, well, then you're basically saying you're infallible, which, let's be honest, That's not true for anyone, because everyone is wrong at least some of the time. As Mill puts it, all silencing of discussion is an assumption of infallibility. Because we all make mistakes, none of us is infallible. Since we can't be sure we're always right about everything, it doesn't make sense to silence other people with different views because we could, without even realizing it, be silencing the truth. Not good. But hold up. You might agree that Mill's got a point, that no one is infallible. So we can never be 100% sure that what we believe is correct. But even so, people have to act in this world. And so, if we're as sure as we can be that we're right, then at least for those beliefs where we're really confident, we should, if we have the power, silence people who disagree. Right? Wrong, says Mill. Mill hits that argument right in the premises. The only way you can be sure that your beliefs are really right and true, Mill says, is if you give people who disagree every opportunity to prove your beliefs wrong. If people try to prove you wrong and fail, then maybe you are right after all. But if people aren't even allowed to try to prove you wrong, well, then you might be missing something and never even know it. Mill writes, There is the greatest difference between presuming an opinion to be true because with every opportunity for contesting it, it has not been refuted, and assuming its truth for the purpose of not permitting its refutation. 
Complete liberty of contradicting and disproving our opinion is the very condition which justifies us in assuming its truth for purposes of action, and on no other terms can a being with human faculties have any rational assurance of being right. In other words, if people can't tell you that you're wrong, there's no way to be sure that you're right. What would you think of a judge who only hears one side of a case? That's not a good judge, and that's a judge who's likely to make lots of mistakes. Just to be clear, Mill doesn't say you shouldn't act on your convictions and beliefs. You should. What you shouldn't do is try to control what others say and prevent other people from hearing different points of view just because you believe something to be true. But what if an opinion really is obviously demonstrably certainly false with no room for doubt or argument? Like thinking that the earth is flat. In that case of complete certainty, would it be okay to silence people who spread false messages? Mill says no, which brings him to his second argument, the danger of dead dogma. Mill starts this argument by asking a tough question. What does it mean to have a true understanding of an idea? If understanding an idea means anything, at a minimum, you need to know why what you believe is true. And part of understanding why your beliefs are true is understanding why opposing arguments are not true. As Mill puts it, he who knows only his own side of the case knows little of that. But if anyone who might advance opposing arguments has been silenced, there is no reliable way to know what those opposing arguments are. The only sure path to a full understanding of truth is to face falsehood and refute it. Mill punctuates this point with a vivid image. Both teachers and learners go to sleep at their post as soon as there is no enemy in the field. But the reality is, it is the rare case where unadulterated truth is lined up against unalloyed falsehood. Most opinions, especially about politics and morality, are rarely, if ever, the whole truth. Often, people who disagree, even if mostly wrong, are right about some things. If those people are silenced, then the things that they are right about might never come to light. Here's what Mill says. When there are persons to be found who form an exception to the apparent unanimity of the world on any subject, even if the world is in the right, it is always probable that the dissentients have something worth hearing to say for themselves, and that truth would lose something by their silence. Ultimately, Mill's vision is a world of progress, where things change over time with new ideas and new values. Those who would silence dissent at the bottom of their beliefs is a vision of a world of stasis, where ideas don't change and neither do values. No matter how much we might fear or worry about change, the world changes whether we like it or not. Every age has judged their ancestors to be wrong about some things, and so it is inevitable that future generations will judge us to be wrong about some things, maybe even a great many things. But that's okay. So long as we keep talking to each other and listening to each other, each trying to grasp that portion of truth we can discover and contribute that portion of truth we think we perceive, we'll be all right and the world will be a better place. So keep talking, keep listening. And thanks for watching this episode of The Legal Mind, How the Law Thinks. We'll see you next time.